Today we are starting a series called Joyful and Justified. We're going to juice up on Romans chapter 5, and I get the thrill of sharing with you some of the most incredible news that the planet has ever heard. We call it the good news. You're at a gospel good news church, uh, and that means that at our church you are free from religion, free from hype, and free from guilt. Instead, we have... um, this good news at the center of our lives that transforms everything. And today, we're going to look at how that transformation occurs. Why does it occur? How does it occur? And who helps it happen uh, by doing all the work for us? So I hope you're ready to go. We're in Romans chapter 5. And, and don't just take my word for it. If you hear something you love, feel free to say something. You can say yes, you can say amen, you can say go Yankees. It's all the same to God. You can say it. Don't even sweat it, okay? So um, I'm going to do my best to make sure that we grasp saving faith, justification, and what that means for everybody, but it's done best by just walking through Romans chapter 5 together. And overall, uh, we're going to see something super important, and the, the main idea of the series is this, that justification... Well, we're going to look at that word justification. Don't sweat it if you're not quite sure what that means yet. Justification by God makes a difference. We use the word in our church family, transformation. It transforms all of life, our heart, our home, and our neighborhoods. Uh, But there's transformation that comes from justification, but not only where we are heading in the future, but also now how we act and how we feel in the moment and in the present. Anybody else could use a little change of how we feel in the moment? in the present, Um, and also that same change happens relative to how we feel and how we act, not just in our present when things are going good, but also during bad times. Things aren't going that great. Circumstances are not working in our favor. So I want you to think, if you would, with me, think of some of the things that bring you peace. Some of the things that bring you peace and I know for me, when I think about that, something very specific turns up, and I kind of have a mental picture of my mind when I'm most at peace, and there's probably a lot of other uh, pictures I could show you, but one that really stood out in my memory is this picture right here. When I am sitting at a campfire, maybe even pond side, lake side, I know some of you do ocean side vacations, we do pond side vacations. I'm not saying I'm better than you or more humble than you, I'm just... I'm just observing. So, uh, sitting at a campfire, it's crackling. Then the smoke, kind of not a lot of smoke, just enough smoke. You smell a little smoky, and everything kind of pieces out. I love that. I love that. Maybe you've got a mental picture in your own mind of what peace is, and it's not pond side, it's ocean side or whatever. But most of us have a hard time grabbing peace because of how fast-paced our lives are, how fast-paced our world is. Most of us are kind of grabbing bits and pieces of peace on the run, just trying to snag a few minutes, just trying to... If you have small infant kids in your home, you're like, I have no idea what peace is, so I don't even remember what it was like. It never happens. I don't even try anymore. Uh, Others probably just grab five minutes of peace just before the children tornado in from elementary school. Some people are grabbing their peace that last half hour of work when all the phones are off, everybody goes home, and you could go home too, but you stay at work because everyone's gone, and that's the only second of peace. Maybe you get into work early to grab your little bit of peace and quiet for yourself. Some people grab it when they're at vacation, and it's just one quiet moment beachside when the sun is rising, and they just snag it. That's their... Maybe one time per year they get their little peace and quiet uh, with, with themselves. Um, I remember when we were raising our kids, we had tiny ones. So we had infants in the car seat and we had toddlers in the car seat. And I remember how often Raquel and I would get home from a long day of whatever we were doing, parenting plus, and we would get to the driveway, and on the trip, the infants and the toddlers had fallen asleep in the car seat. And we would roll up into the driveway late at night, and when we turned the car off, we would sit in silence and listen to the engine cool down. And it makes little tinging noises 
Is ting a word? It tinged. <laughs> Maybe it pinged, probably. It pinged and tinged, and it would just cool down, and we would sit there and go, this is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> so crazy, right? That was the peace that was just enough to satisfy. But, and a lot of people think that peace is really just the absence of conflict. Maybe you come from a home that's full of noise, maybe even conflict, and in your mind, it's peaceful in your life and in your home if people aren't fighting, if there's no conflict, if um, maybe the person who is most um, aggressive, maybe even abusive, maybe if they just calm down for a minute or they're out of the house or they're asleep and you think, Finally, I'm going to take this peace, and it's easy to believe that peace that we need is just no fighting, no yelling, no condescension, no whatever. But really, there's a peace that's more than just absence of conflict. And this is a Bible peace called shalom. You've heard me mention perhaps um, several times that Shalom has become one of my favorite words in the Christian faith that I feel like I neglected for a long, long time and just recently discovered in my adult life. And shalom basically means wholeness. Everything is where it ought to be. Where are my organizers who know what shalom is when you're all done organizing? Where are you? You get the organizing done, you step back and look at it, and you're like, holy shalom. (laughs) I'm feeling it all over me. You know what I'm talking about? Everything's where it's supposed to be, and everything has a place, and it's right where... Well, for our entire lives, God has provided for us something called shalom, and He has ordained it, and He's planned it for our lives, but most of us don't have it. Most of us are missing it. I wanted to mention something, too. When you um, probably... I know we have a lot of Costco members here. I, myself, um, and the number one fan of Costco, so... um, those of you who number two, three, four, good for you. Um, when you become a member of Costco, you get stuff, right? And you are entitled to stuff because you're a paying member. And one of the things that, that you get from Costco is you get wholesale discounts on stuff that you would otherwise overpay for in something called retail. You also get extra sale prices now. This is relatively new in the past few years. The wholesale prices are now discounted and they're on sale. And if you're a member at Costco, you also get the hot dog combo. (laughs) Same price since the mid-80s, you know that? It's amazing. I got a story about that, but we don't have time for you to... So I'll I'll catch you on your way out because no one will say great message. They will say, what was the story about Costco's hot dogs that you were going to tell us, right? So also you get more for less. They do tires, right? They do pharmacy. There's so many other things that they do. They also do cash back, credit card. One of the things that you get at Costco that's probably the most important thing to me is I get peace of mind that what I'm buying is the best value. I don't have to race around and run around wondering, wondering is there some place I could get this for a better, better value? So, so um, follow along with me here. If that's what I get at Costco... What do I get when I become a member, when I join God's family? What are the benefits that I get as a part of God's family? Now, there are limitless benefits. I could go on and on about how the biblical Bible describes them all. But relative to Romans chapter 5, one of the benefits that we get as a member of God's family, this is so important for us to grasp, we're going to get it in the book of Romans, and Paul's going to unpack it for us. One of the memberships... One of the aspects of membership is the way that Paul is going to unpack what it means to know Jesus in such a way as you experiencing something called saving faith. Saving faith. In our daily life, where the gospel Christian experiences something called um, saving faith. Now, how do we find... Where do we get, and how do we get this saving faith? Well, it comes with it when saving faith occurs. Something extraordinary happens as a member of the family of God, and that is that we get peace with God. Peace with God. So, love all the benefits that Costco's given me. Nothing has changed my life more. It's hard for me to say this publicly. Nothing has changed my life more than Costco, quite like becoming a part of God's family. 
the change that has occurred in finding peace with God. So how do we find this peace? It's real simple. Check this out. We can have peace with God because of what Jesus has done for us. Now, if you've been around the church family long enough, you're a part of our church family on a regular basis, I want you to tell yourself something. Um, Would you do this for me? Just play along. Just whisper to yourselves, pay attention. No, I want everybody to do it. Whisper to yourselves in your mind, pay attention. Here's why I say that. Because this, peace with God because of what Jesus has done for us, this is so easy to sleep on. So easy to sleep on because Jesus has done, oh, I mean, we sing about it, we talk about it, I'm in church all the time, I read about it, I'm doing stuff, I'm meeting with God, I'm praying, and of course, all I keep hearing, it's overwhelming, especially, and maybe you have kids and you've heard this, okay, I, I, I don't know how many times you need to tell me this, what? That Jesus has done X, Y, and Z for us, right? It's easy to sleep on this. So, would you lock in with me? Would you say, all right, I'm going to give this another shot. Because I believe that God is going to reveal something to you in a fresh way and a new insight that's going, to, that's going to grow your faith today, that's going to bring some joy out of your life today that maybe wasn't there to begin with. And chapter 5 in Romans begins with this massive word. It's such an important word for us to grasp, and it's the word therefore. Now, if you've done any kind of Bible college stuff you will know what it means when you come across this word, and it goes like this. When you see the word therefore, then what? You have to ask what it's there for. Why is therefore there? And here in this big, huge word, we're going to see that Paul is building Romans chapter 5 on chapters 1 through 4. And chapters 1 through 4 are a picture, an overwhelming picture of the depravity of human beings. Not depravity of the bad guys or the criminals or those who don't agree with me or the bad guys who um, treated me poorly, but of the human race, the depravity of the human race. And then Paul puts that on the backdrop of the supreme holiness of God. And that's where we start with those first four chapters. And the idea that somehow we can have peace with God, with His holiness and our depravity, is really unlikely. It's very hard for us to take in, conceive, or believe. Yet, that is precisely what God offers us here in chapter 5 after setting us up in verses one, uh, chapters 1 through 4. So, here's a quick summary of what he is saying as therefore turns the entire argument, or it turns uh, um, all the insight, he, he, he's turning from chapters 1 through 4. But I want to summarize it for you for the sake of our time. Let's look at Romans 1 and 3, four verses. Do you have time for four verses? Okay. This is not our main text. I want to make sure you catch this. We're going to summarize where Paul's coming from when he says, therefore, based on what we've just heard, check this out. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. Good news. Capital G, capital N. I'm so grateful that God is building here among the North Central Church family a church based on good news, not the bad news that you're, uh, um, that you're failing and that your, your behavior needs to improve and, and all that it's based on this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes the Jew first, and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. Would you say faith with me? Faith. It's accomplished. Oh, I love this. It's accomplished from start at the beginning, and it's accomplished at the end, and everything in between by faith. We're going to talk about why that's so important. As the Scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because your acquittal, you recognize that word? Where's that word from? It's a justice word, right? It's a judgment word. It's a legal system word. So our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith not based on our obedience, it's based on our faith. So, we are made right with God through faith, not by 
obeying the law. Now, why is Paul writing this in his letter to the church at Rome? Why is Paul writing this? There's a reason why he spends four chapters describing all this. And we just saw the summary of it. And the reason is um, because of who was in the church. Now, of course, Gentiles in Rome were coming, becoming Christians, right? So by Gentiles, you know what I mean by Gentiles? These are non-Jews. They are not sharing in the covenant of Abraham, the promises of God. These are outsiders who are not Hebrew people who belong to God, who he said, remember, you're my people and I'm your God and I'm making these promises to you and I have covenants and prophets and so on. Instead, the Gentiles are outsiders. They have come to saving faith through this good news and they are starting to emerge as the local church in Rome. So Rome has a church, Rome, Italy. They have a church. The entire empire... And they start to kind of bloom as gospel Christians. And there's a Roman historian. And the Roman historian, his name is Suetonius. Suetonius tells a story about the emperor. And he says that the emperor, whose name is Claudius, expelled the Jews from Rome in AD 49. This is fascinating. So the empire expels the Jews out of Rome, and this church that's emerged... Oh, by the way, you know why he expelled them? There was this strife over this, and this is what, the, um, this is what Claudius said, I'm sick of the strife over Crestus. And the historian says he probably didn't mean Crestus, he got the, wrong, he got the name wrong. Who does he mean? Christus. He is sick of the strife over Christ. And the, uh, um, and the historian says, so Claudius expels all of the Hebrews to bring peace in Rome. And so eventually what happened is the, the um, Jewish Christians started to come back to the church. And you can imagine that the church had emerged over the years without any Jews. And then the Jews come back to Rome and they're like, what's going on? Nobody's following the law. Where are the rule keepers? These people can't call themselves Christians. They don't even know God like we know God. Who do they think they are? And all of a sudden... Paul says, oh my goodness, i gotta, I got to write this letter and fix all this chaos. And so Paul writes a letter to the church at Rome and he says, you got, I, I have something incredible to tell you. The good news of the gospel that I'm not ashamed of has come to us through Christ and it's going to bring peace and unity and transformation for all of you, not just for Jews and not just for Gentiles, for everybody. And in Ephesians, he writes it this way, you're going to become one new family, one new humankind that you're going to become. And by the way, the expulsion of the Jews from Rome is confirmed, and you can see it in Acts chapter 18, uh, uh, verse 2. So, over the years, this church is developing. The Jews come, and now the Jews and Gentiles are are in conflict. We have the rule-following Jews who are mad because the Gentiles aren't following the rules, and you have Gentiles who are mad at the Jews who start telling them now they've got to do stuff like observe laws and rules and the Old Testament uh, Leviticus laws that they have to circumcise the, 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 their, their children and they have to follow and submit to these food laws. And uh, the new Gentile Christians who live free of these restrictions were like, uh-uh, we ain't doing that. We're not going back to that. That's not what we signed up for. Our, uh, what we signed up for is something completely different. So it seems now that this ch- church was made, made up of mainly Gentiles and as these Jewish Christians started to come back to the city, Paul said, I'm going to straighten this out. How does he straighten out? Read for yourself Romans, the book of Romans. Unbelievable. Such a great book. Anybody over the course of their life, Romans has been or is your favorite book of the Bible? Anybody? I have been. I told you recently it's no longer my favorite book. You know, I feel like for, for so long, it's the same with apples. I really love the, those empire apples. And then all of a sudden, you're like, hello, honey crisp. Hello. You know what I'm talking about? And I was like, you're number two now. I have received Honeycrisp into my heart. I feel the same way about Romans. You know, I grow up on Romans. It nourishes me for so long. And then eventually you start to discover there's parts of Romans that come alive in Colossians and Galatians and so on. And So um, anyway, so Paul writes this letter to the church at Rome. So he also so this is what he's done. Therefore means all of that. Okay. So then we continue on here in in chapter uh, five, verse one, and here's what he says. And he says, 
since we have been made right in God's sight by faith. This is so huge, so important, so vital for us. We have been made right in God's sight by faith. So, you've heard us mention this, myself, a handful of other uh, people who speak to you on a regular basis from this platform as church leaders. We use this phrase, saving faith. And you know, some people say you should never say saving faith because people who don't have saving faith will feel bad. And I always think to myself, well, if it's a Bible word, I want to use the Bible word. I don't want to throw away the Bible word because someone feels bad about the Bible word, and then eventually you're like, I can't say any more Bible words (laughs) because people feel bad about it. So I'd rather explain what saving faith means, and basically what Paul is writing here is that there is something called saving faith. Did you know that? Saving faith. Um, to me, it's important that we stop here and discover what does saving faith mean? Because it helps you say, do I have it? When did I have it? Um, how did I have it? Um, and so we use this phrase all the time. So, simple question for you. What is saving faith? Well, it's in contrast to this idea that faith comes by obedience or that faith equals obedience. Instead, what this means is that faith equals trust in God's provision and what He's provided. So, it's a lack of, it's not a faith in my obedience, it's a faith in, a, a faith, a faith in what God has provided for us to save us. And in Romans 4, 5, we see that saving faith consists of ending. You're going to stop one kind of trust, and you're going to start up a new kind of trust. Check this out. This is Romans 4, 5. I hope you can keep up with these verses. They're all very similar. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work. Huge. And if you come from a background where you are a work-for-your-salvation kind of background, you may not even know it. But one of the signs is you felt guilty all the time. One of the signs is you're like, you know what, I'm exhausted. I can never do enough. I don't ever feel like I'm in right standing with God because I never feel like I'm behaving right. Right? So you may have come from a faith background at church. And by the way, nobody's like, you know what, we're gonna be we're gonna be a church that makes everybody feel guilty because of their faith is based on their own effort. Let's do that. Wouldn't it be great? We'd have so many people. It's not how it works. But it's a lack of emphasis and a lack of understanding of what saving faith is. So it's not because of their work or their effort or their behavior or their performance or how faithful they are to God, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. So, a saved person, as a saved person, you don't work to be saved. But this cannot mean that a saved person disregards God's boundaries and rules, regulations, and designs, right? It doesn't mean that. We're not throwing those away. It must, therefore, mean that the saved person no longer trusts in their own obedience. And if you trust in your own obedience, there's a word for that in the New Testament called Pharisee. A Pharisee trusts in their own obedience, their own righteousness, their own holiness, their own, um, their own uh, good standing with God based on their own well-doneness, right? So, um, you trust God who justifies the wicked, and this means that a Christian is one who trusts that God has a way, He's provided a way to save you separate from, apart from your own effort. And by the way, I'd like to say this, apart from your own failing effort, apart from your own inconsistent effort, unfaithfulness effort, right? Um, That's how I would describe my effort, just not enough. And sometimes I would call it effortless. (laughs) It's less effort than ever, than anyone would expect. So, um, Saving faith, then, is a, faith, is a trust transfer. I hope you grasp that today. I hope you, if you write stuff down, if you fill in blanks, if you write notes to yourself, I hope you grab this. Saving faith means that you've transferred your trust out of and off of your own effort, work, behavior, and holiness, and you have transferred it to the holiness, effort, behavior, and work of Jesus. See what I mean? It's a transfer, removing one's hope and trust from other things, functional saviors, idols, myself, my righteousness, and instead, uh, I place them in Jesus, His work, 
as my Savior. So, verse 5 uh, ends here by saying that if we stop trusting in ourselves as justifiers, we start trusting God as our justifier. He justifies us before Him. So, so can we stop? Do you remember Ron Co? Anybody remember? Are you old enough to remember? Well, let me ask you this. Um, who is 50 and over and you remember Ronco? You remember Ronco, the, the, the infomercials? Who is under 50 and remembers Ronco? You watch TV Land, TV Land, TV Land. You're not under 50. Uh, anyways, I'm just kidding. Um, do you remember this? You just said it and forget it. Do you remember that? That's why, you don't remember that? That's why, that's why Ronco, Ronco sold so uh, many things, <laughs> trinkets, because of the phrase that we're still saying now in 2022 from the platform, while I'm supposed to be preaching, I'm saying, set it and forget it. But here's the idea, right? That you just work one little time and then you just forget it. So here's my question. If this is all true, do do Christians with saving faith stop working? Do we just set it and forget it? We're like, hey, God saved us. I transferred my trust out of my work into God's trust, and now I am... Happy to tell you, Pastor Dan tells me every Sunday, I am free. I am free from religion, hype, and guilt. No more. I am doing my own. Of course not. It's not what it means. It doesn't mean that at all. In fact, Tim Keller puts it this way. A Christian is one who stops working to be saved, but not one who stops working. So we're not working to be saved. This is so good. We're working from our salvation. Now it's a new holiness that comes out of our joy and our gratitude, not a holiness that's full of fear and hoping that the scales balance and that our work is going to count enough against our rap sheet, right? So um, we can stop working to be saved because of something called justification. Justification. Here's another word I hope you grasp. This is such a thrill to tell you about justification. If you know about it, I'm equally as thrilled to remind you about it. If you don't know about justification, this is such an incredible privilege to tell you that the good news of the gospel has at its fundamental goodness this word called justification, this idea. This is what, um, when Pastor Jonathan says, we're going to respond to the revelation of God, who He is and what He's done. And when we get to what He's done, this is what we mean. We mean justification. He's justified us. And that means that we get amped up, not hyped up, but we get amped up over the truth that justification by God is for me. I get to receive this and I get to live with this kind of freedom and joy. This is what gets me so amped up about this. So the definition of justification, it's God's declaration. He has made a judgment. You can imagine a supreme like this infinite size gavel that God has slammed down in the court of the universe and He has declared that you and I are righteous. Not just that we're innocent of the charges, but that actually, it's even better than that, we are righteous as we are being charged. So, on account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Does he hate the word justification, Chrissy? Is that what just happened? That is bad news. That is very bad news. Sorry to embarrass you. All right, on the account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, this is what justification means. Can I run three things by you really quick? You don't have to absorb this because this is, this. I mean, this could be a series too. But here are three things that justification means. It means that for you, when God says, righteous, I've looked at your, I've, I've, I've looked and I've decided in this supreme court that the charges against you by the enemy of being rebellious and self-righteous and whatever, I declare you righteous. Here's what it means. It means three things. The demands of the law of God are met somehow. Somehow, God demands that we follow His law, and somehow we have been declared righteous that we did it. Secondly, our sinful record of rebellion expunged. There's a word Write that down. If you love research, research the word expunged. As if they were never levied against you. Thirdly, believers are granted the status of being righteous in the sight of God. Imagine God looks at you and He doesn't see someone who tried really hard but needed help. He looks at you and sees the righteousness of Jesus. How does that happen? Because God has declared that we are righteous out of His own grace. 
in spite of ourselves. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? I mean, it thrills me that one day, as someone who is experienced and who has embraced saving faith, I don't have to stand, I'm getting ahead of myself now, but I can't help it, that I don't have to stand before God and be like, oh man, this appointment here is, it came much quicker than I thought, and I'm going to see God, and I am all nerved up because I have not followed the law because there are charges against me, and most of them are pretty dead on. And thirdly, I know he expects righteousness. He's not going to find it in me. No way. And then Paul describes this confidence that we get that we're going to get to. So here in chapter 5, he begins with this ringing affirmation that we have an official legal standing in the supreme courthouse of God the supreme courtroom of God. And the supreme authority, God, who created the universe is on the throne of the universe making judgments. And He justifies us. He declares us righteous. By God, one time for always. Completely separate of what you and I have done. Completely separate from our works, our attendance, our faithfulness, and so on. So, here's how he goes on in this verse. Now, because of this, uh, by the way, there's three things I'm going to run by you, three things that happen because of justification, okay? Number one is, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. In light of all that we have seen, we get these three realities that we now get to experience because of justification. So, there are present benefits of justification that change our life. That is not just something a preacher says, something that you read in a reference book, or occasionally you hear in a sermon, or you read in a Christian living book. There are three benefits of justification that um, start with this. We have peace with God. Peace with God. I just described one scenario where it's time to meet God and you're on the jitters and you got the jitters because you're going to be judged by God. But the peace of God is subjective. In other words, it does impact and calm uh, and satisfy our heart in the middle of crisis, chaos, circumstances that are not going our way, or trouble or pressure. So we have a subjective sensation that there's inner peace and we feel calmer. Also, we have an inner peace regarding the cares of the world, the things that all the world is worried about. We have an inner peace that says we don't have to worry about that. But it's also objective. It's not just a subjective peace that you feel. It's an objective peace that means that the state of hostilities between God and us has been erased. The state of hostilities. It's a peace with regard to God. It's the way God feels about our relationship. And it happens whether or not I feel happy or secure, it has been deeply and dramatically affected and changed. I mean, um, some of you spend time with your siblings who you love and you're like, you know what, I'm so happy to be a brother and have a sister or have a brother and so on. And other people, uh, and then eventually that person maybe lives somewhere else or you don't see him for a while, and you don't start to think to yourself, do I have siblings I haven't talked to him, seen him. I don't feel a certain way about my sibling. Of course, that doesn't mean you no longer have siblings. It's an objective fact that you have siblings, right? Um, maybe it would be better to think in terms of kids, right? When our kids are with us, we're thinking about them, they're on our mind. We think, oh, I love having kids, um, or I used to love having kids, whatever you think about. <laughs> and then eventually they're not with you, and you have moments where you're like, you know, I don't necessarily feel anything, but it's an objective fact. And that's, the, uh, uh, that's what peace of God means, so it also means that before salvation, get this, it means before salvation, there's a war that is being waged between us and God. Paul says it this way, we used to be enemies of God. There was a wall of hostility that divided us. Before saving faith, there's this war happening. When we disobey God, a couple things happen. Number one is that we assert our own autonomous authority to decide for ourselves how we're going to live our life. That's one of the things that happens. Um, we claim kingship over our own lives. Now, get this. If we are claiming autonomous kingship over our own lives and we're deciding what's best and what's good and what's not so good and how we're going to do things, there's also another king who rules over us who is also claiming authority over that very same thing. 
So when we're the king of our life, we're at war with the other king over the universe. And so that um, kingship puts these two parties into this conflict, into this war, and our disobedience means that God has a problem with us. You know, I mean, it's so easy to uh, kind of send, uh, we would grow our church faster if I only ever told you that God never has a problem with us. He's so delighted in everything that you do and all that you are. Just keep on going. You can do it, and eventually, if you need them, God will sprinkle a little help in. And all your dreams will come true, and all your ambitions you will succeed. Instead, what we see in the Scriptures is, because of our depravity, we're at war with God over the kingship of our lives. We say, I'm on the throne, and God's like, uh, you have a tiny throne. And I always picture this. God's able to go, you know how tiny that throne is? Watch this. <laughs> I always picture that. Zing! There goes my throne. Where does it go? I don't know. Into the infinite space that God is resting His feet on. Can't help but picture it that way. So, our disobedience means that God has a problem with us. It's not just that we're hostile to Him. Uh, instead, God's wrath is upon us. And in Romans chapter 1, uh, Paul describes God's anger as very different from ours. It's not a vengeful anger. You know how when we are angry, there's a lot of amped up emotion to it, right? It's like, it's a, it's a strong emotion perhaps, where you think of anger and wrath as an emotion. With God's anger, it's more of a legal position. Um, it's something that is entitled, it is deserved, it is earned. And consequently, it's less emotion and it's more, um, it's actually more, it's not vindictive or vengeful. In fact, there's a sentence on us, a sentence to death, Paul says in Romans. And it cannot be discarded, and we can't just wish it away. We can't just cross our fingers and think, you know what, I'm just going to have good vibes and good wishes for everybody, and I'm going to tell God, hey, we're at peace, right? No, we don't determine the battle. We don't determine whether or not we're at peace with God. He determines it. So uh, um, I hope you see that that's why we need peace with God. It's not something that we achieve, it's not something that we deserve, it's not something that we plot and plan and end up overcoming. So how do we get and how do we keep this peace with God, who is at war with us, who is wrath and death is something that we deserve legally, how do we, how do we get this peace and how do we keep this peace with this God King uh, who's at war with us? Well, because of our faith, this is... Verse 2, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. So how did we get there? Do we wander in one day? We're like, whoa, hey, look at all this peace. God, you're so awesome that you're filling my whole life with peace. We don't wander in. Um, the worship leader doesn't usher us in. The Holy Spirit doesn't usher us in. To the, this is not what happens. We are brought there by Christ Jesus, the same way the chief of staff brings you into the White House and says, you have an appointment with the president because the authority is so much bigger than your own, you have to be brought in there by a dignitary. So Jesus, our dignitary, meets us where we are, and he says, I'm going to bring you into the throne room, and I'm going to robe you in my righteousness, and I'm going to walk you in there, and I'm going to be with you the whole time advocating, so you don't got to sweat the reaction. You don't got to sweat it. I'm with you. And you deserve a lot of bad stuff, but I've already absorbed it in your behalf to justify you. So now you can be brought into this place of privilege. But there's a word there. Don't miss it. It's undeserved. It doesn't mean I loathe myself. It means I recognize who's done the work. That's what it means. The one who deserves it is the Son, but the one who gets it is me. And so, I'm, I'm brought into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. So, we can only develop this personal, this is like, basically Jesus says, now you're going to have a personal relationship with God. You don't have to send in the priest anymore to see God on your behalf. Um, there is a new high priest who brings you into the Holy of Holies. There's, you don't have to um, uh, practice a certain routine, ritual, or religion. Instead, Jesus meets you and He says, upon your saving faith, He's saying, Here, here's what's going to happen. When you pray a prayer, and it's a prayer of transfer of trust. I don't trust 
my own work anymore. I'm going to trust the work of Jesus. Check out what happens. He takes your rap sheet. You know what a rap sheet is? How many of you are um, convicted criminals? You know exactly. I'm just kidding. <laughs> a rap sheet, right? You've, like, you've been convicted of some stuff, and it's like eventually you have a sheet full of convictions, right? Here's what happens. Jesus says, give me your rap sheet, and then I got another R word for you. He says, but I'm going to give you something in place of this rap sheet. I have a resume. My resume is perfection, obedience, joy, devotion, faithfulness. I've been so faithful, Jesus says. I've been been obedient even unto death. I've been obedient to God to the point it took me to the worst kind of human uh, execution that exists on the planet. I did it. That's on my resume. I'm going to give that to you. And you're like, so I hold on to this? You, you hold on to that. I'm going to hold on to your rap sheet. Come on, let's go see the king, the God king of the universe. And then, by God's grace, we don't get a quick little visit, and then he signs our hat, and then we say, thank you. And by the way, I always wear this T-shirt that says, no God, no peace, no God, no peace. I always wear this. I just want you to know. You don't, it's none of that. You get to stay in the throne room of the supreme creator of the universe every day of your life. You are with God who sent Jesus to be with us and then through saving faith we are in His throne room and have a friendship with God that is allowed because of justification. And we get to have access to God. So, so get this, grace is just not sparing you from something bad, it is giving you something good. Uh, Pastor Rob used to say this all the time. God doesn't save us just from something, uh, just save us from our sin, to, from something bad. He saves us to something good, to friendship with God. And that is so important that we see this. So a present benefit of justification, we're brought into the undeserved privilege in which we now stand. We're brought in that we stand in that privilege. Now, a lot of people believe, and this might be you, and if you have saving faith, This is something that could be life-changing. Imagine this. You have to tell yourself, boy, that was so bold. One of the things you can do is preach to yourself. Anybody ever get stuck listening to themselves instead of talking to themselves? You have to like, I need to stop listening to myself and start talking to myself. It's so helpful, especially if you know the gospel. And you tell yourself stuff like this. God is not going to punish you. You are not being punished because your life isn't working out the way that you had hoped. Bad circumstances do not mean you're in the doghouse with God. Because of justification, God is not punishing you. God is privileging you. You have an undeserved privilege that He gives us that we stand with, which gives us access to God to develop a personal relationship with God in the throne room of God where we stand and remain. Of course, for those of you who are literal, I mean that figuratively, right? You are figuratively able to approach God. We're always with Him in His heavenly throne room. So, we don't just get freedom from hostility, but we also get the presence of friendship. Is that good news? I mean, that's such good news to me. Such good news. So, um, last part. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. So, we get a new future. We get confidence and joy over our future. Now, how many of you tend to be a little bit nerved up about the uncertainties of your future? Would you raise your hand? How many people look in your future, and when it's uncertain, you get nerved up? doesn't matter what it is, right? You're like, well, I hope the milk, the 2% milk is still there for my cereal. So, it is not uncommon for human beings to not just be nerved up about the uncertainties at work, school, friendship, what am I going to see online, what's going to happen uh, at home with my marriage, whatever. That's not uncommon. But imagine this. Because of God's justifying grace, we don't have to be nerved up about what's going to happen to us when we finally meet up with God at the end. Instead, we can have confidence. This is not, by the way, this confidence is not just hopeful wishing. Right? It's not like, ah, fingers crossed, I'm wishing for the best. And if you ask me, I would say, well, I'm really hopeful. Confidence means an assurance. I believe something that I'm sure is going to happen. Right? I have confidence 
that when I leave this space, I'm going to walk out and I'm going to see my car sitting there because of there's a level of confidence through the faithfulness or the um, repeated pattern. And that's what this means. But also there's going to be joy. That means I may be unhappy with my circumstances, but I have joy about my ultimate future. That means I'm not thrilled to die and have the whole death experience, but it doesn't it doesn't overwhelm me with paralysis because I'm not quite sure how I'm going to die, but I know that after I die, something terrific is in store for me. I have certainty. I have hope-filled certainty. Um, and, and, and by itself, hell, heaven can be kind of an abstract, but imagine that if you have access to God and you are meeting with Him and He is kind of satisfying your desires, you're starting to sense God's presence and His, the way that He has replaced your rap sheet with Jesus' resume, uh, uh, resume, eventually you can start to taste and see that the Lord is good. And this kind of joy says, I've been with God, I've started to taste and see that He is good, so now I'm anticipating an eternity of the same thing. That's where this joy and hope comes from. And this confidence comes, this hope of glory that I'm going to be with Jesus. So, um, Paul here has been cutting away any of the ideas that we humans are able to work our way into right standing with God. And this is something that makes non-religious people, um, when they read it, it could, could mean that it makes you uncomfortable. If you're non-religious, you could be uncomfortable because you're like, well, then what am I trying to be a good person for? Am I just wasting my life? Am I wasting my time? Am I wasting my effort trying, trying to be a decent person? If God doesn't care whether I'm good or not so good, if somehow He's not measuring that, it also, when, when a professing Christian reads this, it also could be alarming for the person who is constantly comparing their own moral behavior to other not-so-great Christians or to non-believers. And we realize none of that matters to God in the scheme of things. And Paul has proved that justification by faith was, it continues to be, and will always be the righteousness that is credited to those with saving faith. So, that means that you and I don't have the grounds that we would need to do any boasting, right? And, and probably most of us aren't really um, quick to boast. But what I mean by that is a confidence in our own righteousness. No boasting. And a symptom of that is that I compare myself to other people and I condemn other people for their lack of righteousness as if my righteousness is better than theirs. So that's a symptom of boasting. I boast in the way that I feel about other people, or I feel about those people who call themselves Christian. That's my, that's my big one, someone who calls themselves a Christian. They call, it came out a couple of, maybe it was last Sunday, other Christian leaders who say they're one thing, and then they act that way, and you're like, you know what? Your righteousness is lame. Mine's way better than yours. Right? Boasting in my own righteousness. Also, it means no self-loathing. I don't just have to abandon boasting, but I also don't have the grounds that are there for me to loathe myself. And the reason is, uh, 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 which basically means guilt over our unrighteousness. And the symptom of that is condemning myself for my own unrighteousness, constantly thinking about how I'm failing and I'm so full of flaws and faults that God can't possibly accept me. And of course, we're reminded that He accepts you but it isn't based on anything that you've done. It's based on what Jesus has done. And the righteousness of Jesus is credited and received. And knowing this leads us to give glory to God. Knowing this leads us to be gracious to other people. And it leads us to have a hopeful humility about ourselves. Hopeful humility about ourselves. We celebrate this justification the first Sunday of every month. You've got some uh, communion elements at the seats that are nearby. So um, if you are here today and you have saving faith, I want you to grab that, those elements. Um, you can take very carefully, take that top film off. Um, and we're going to spend some time together remembering, remembering exactly how Jesus took our place by absorbing our, his, our death and by living the life that um, we were supposed to live. And 
then, I want you to start thinking about this, then after we receive communion, uh, we're going to sing and celebrate this unbelievably good news. And then I want to invite you to think about, is there a way, how can we pray with you? You might not be familiar with this, but on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, our church family has some people that are willing to pray with you. They come up to the front, and a little bit later, I'm going to invite you out of your seat, and you're going to um, have the opportunity to let somebody take their little faith and put it together with your little faith, and when you put it together, you're just saying, God, we're desperate for you to intervene here. Whether you need a relationship healing or you need a physical healing or you need um, maybe emotional, mental healing, you need some kind of healing, we trust that God is at work bringing healing, not just to our bodies, minds, spirits, souls, relationships, but also healing to our heart. Newness. If you have saving faith, we invite you to join us today in observing communion. If you don't, we want you to hold off, and this is why. Not because you're not a part or because we're up here and you're not up here. Rather, because when you receive communion, we want you to have the full joy of what it means. The full joy of what it means to have been justified by faith. Sound good? Sounds good.